Hello, and welcome to Meet the Candidates, a show where we give residents the opportunity to learn a little bit more about who's running for office, whether it's their favorite food or why we should vote for them. No matter the question, we will get the answers. I'm your host, Candace Mashat, and my guest right now is running for circuit court judge. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Don Weir. Hello, Don. Hi, how are you today, Candace? I am doing well. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. <laughs> Good. I'm so happy to have you on with us this evening. I know that everyone is really excited to learn a little bit more about you. So please give us a brief description um, of your background. Okay. First of all, I want to thank you guys for having me on here. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm a lifelong resident of Genesee County. Um, I went to Bentley Community Schools in Burton, K through 12. I graduated from Bentley in 1993. And then from there, I went to the University of Michigan, Flint, and that's where I got my bachelor's degree. And then from there, I went to law school down in Detroit at the University of Detroit Mercy. And I lived in the city of Flint while I was going to school down there. So I've been here my whole life. Um, I have three beautiful daughters. I'm a single mother. And my family lives here, my mother, my brothers. Uh, Genesee County is home to me and it will always be home to me. Um, I've been a lawyer for over 21 years, or excuse me, over 20 years, going on 21 years uh, in November. Uh, my practice um, is pretty much a general practice. Um, I do uh, family law, criminal defense, uh, civil law, uh, real estate, uh, civil litigation. It's a pretty general practice. I also do uh, probate and uh, state planning, trust administration. Um, so that's just a little bit about my practice. I worked for a firm for 10 and a half years. And then uh, in 2010, I decided to go out on my own. And uh, I've been on my own, running my own law practice ever since. Okay. So what types of uh, cases are handled in circuit court? For those of us who might have um, I guess had the fortune to never run into having to go to a circuit court or go to court at all. Uh, tell us a little bit about what type of cases are handled in circuit court. Okay. And that's a great question. And you're right. If you don't know, that's usually a good sign. So uh, the types of cases that are handled in circuit court are family law cases, which would consist of divorces, custody actions, parenting time issues, child support issues, paternity issues, abuse and neglect, uh, juvenile crimes. Um, also civil cases where the amount in controversy is over $25,000. So that would be uh, your larger uh, civil cases, medical malpractice, that type of thing. And then also um, criminal cases, once they are bound over from district court, and if the district court judge finds there's enough evidence to move that case forward, then it goes up to the circuit court and it moves through the circuit court through trial if necessary. So, and you just told us um, right before we talked about the type of cases that are handled in circuit court. Tell us a little bit about your background. Can you do me a favor and just tie it in a little bit better of how your background um, makes you suited to handle those types of cases? Absolutely. So on the civil end of it, um, I have a practice civil law my entire career. Um, I've practiced it in state court and in federal court. Um, those cases have consisted of you know, breach of contract, um, business uh, partnerships or businesses that have broken up and there may have been a controversy over, you know, it wasn't an amicable parting of the ways. Um, I've also handled uh, uh, Elliot Larson civil rights cases, which is uh, if an employer has been sued for, uh, you know, some sort of misconduct under the statute. Um, I've handled cases where I've actually represented the employer or some of their employees. Um, I've done, uh, you know, breach of contract cases. Um, let's see, I've even represented some colleagues in uh, legal malpractice cases. Um, and then on the family front, um, I have handled divorces with and without children. Um, I've handled cases involving custody uh, disputes. I've handled uh, child support cases. 
I've also handled um, paternity actions. Um, actually had a gentleman that uh, actually stepped up to the plate and filed a paternity action because he was the dad and he wanted to be a part of that baby's life. It doesn't happen a lot, but it does occasionally. Um, I've handled change of domicile cases um, in the family court. And then as it relates to the criminal, um, I've handled criminal cases from the point of when they begin in district court all the way up through circuit court. Um, I was on the felony court appointed list here in Genesee County for several years where I represented uh, indigent defendants who cannot afford an attorney uh, to help them through their felony cases. And then in 2019, I began on a new team. Uh, the state of Michigan gave a grant to the courts that allowed uh, additional representation for people that weren't able to afford an attorney, beginning even at the arraignment stage of, which is the very beginning of any criminal case, um, because people weren't having representation at the arraignment process. And that's where uh, the defendant needs to understand the charges against them, understand um, you know, their rights. So we are there to help them understand their charges, the maximum penalty, their rights, and help them uh, argue bond, uh, which is, you know, a, a critical part of the process as well, because, you know, the better you can argue bond, the, you know, the better chance you have of getting a more reasonable bond or a personal mm -hmm. cognizance bond. That team that I'm on now also handles um, the misdemeanors uh, through trial if necessary. Mm -hmm. So if they are arraigned on a felony, then they would go up to uh, the court appointed list on the felony list. If they are a misdemeanor, then they would stay with my team. And I, and I think that that is actually um, really good work there that you're doing as far as helping people who may not have access to, you know, bonds. So how do you, what, how do you feel about going to a cashless uh, bail system? Well, I think it depends on the type of crime. And I do think, and this was something that I actually spoke with another group about, um, I was asked a question about, you know, some sort of bond reform. Um, right now, bonds can be pretty subjective depending on the judge who is handling the arraignment. So you get some judges that are just naturally more strict when it comes to bonds, and you have some judges that are just, you know, a little more lenient. Um, depending on their take on the defendant, the case, um, the allegations. Um, so I was asked, do you think it's a good idea if there were some more parameters or you know criteria that judges need to look at when they are setting bonds? I think I don't think that's a bad idea because I think that you would have more consistent bonds and less subjective bonds. Um, I don't think we can just go to everybody gets a personal recognizance bond. I still think that definitely factors should be considered. Um, you know, the person's prior record, um, the type of case, what the allegations are. I mean, I know we are all proven, um, I mean, innocent until proven guilty, but there is the need to ensure the safety of the community as well. But I definitely would think that addressing some sort of, you know, bond reform where there's just some more criteria where it's just, you know, you don't have these you know, if you go in one day and you're arraigned by one judge with the exact same charge and the exact same facts that you get this completely different bond than somebody who might have heard the case on another day. And so uh, being in, in the field that you've been in for over 21 years, I imagine that you, um, are, you, you do your job very well. And so just tell me, what would you consider some of your strengths? Well, I take my job, and it has been over 20. I think I misspoke at first, okay. so I apologize. Yeah, it'll be 21 in November. Okay. Um, just want to make sure that the record's clear. Um, so I, I think my strengths are that um, I take my job very seriously. Um, I believe I'm a knowledgeable person, and if I don't know the answer, I have um, the wherewithal to go look it up or to consult with a colleague, because we can't all know everything, and we're not perfect. But knowing when you need more information on something or where you're falling short on a subject matter and knowing that, hey, I need to go get the correct answer to this. So I do believe I have the you know ability to assess and say, yeah, I need more information on this. Um, so I believe I'm knowledgeable and I can understand and recognize when I don't have knowledge and I need to get more. Mm -hmm. um, one thing, I, I believe I'm compassionate. I care about my job. And right now I'm dealing with misdemeanors and some people might think, yeah, they're just misdemeanors. 
well, it's not a felony. You're right. So you don't have the ability to be sentenced to prison, but it's still a big deal in a lot of these people's lives. And for instance, um, you know, you might have an instance where a person gets into an argument with somebody and they're charged with an assault case. And I've had ladies come to me that were certified nursing assistants through the state of Michigan, and they wanted to go and become a registered nurse at some point. Well, you can't do that if you have an assaultive conviction on your record. So then I work with the prosecutor. Okay, what can we do? What kind of plea or what kind of resolution can we do where we're not going to jeopardize this lady's licensure? Um, or just as simple as somebody who's, you know, pulled over for driving while license suspended, but they're working for get, to get their license back. So we try to work out something where they're not going to lose their license longer and they're not going to jeopardize, you know, losing their job because now they can't drive to work. So what seems kind of simple and it, but really it's, it's a big deal in these people's lives. And I really do feel like I try to help people out. Or if I think somebody has <clears throat> a substance abuse problem or perhaps a mental health problem, I like to try to see if there's anything we can do to address that issue. We have a lot of great specialty courts in Genesee County. We have sobriety court, drug court, mental health court, and veterans court. So I think I really try to listen to my clients, realize what their issues are, and I try to resolve things in a way that's going to be, you know, in their best interest, because not all people are inherently bad. Sometimes people just, they, they have make a bad judgment call or, you know, they have a bad night. I mean, we're all human after all. So I do believe I listen to them and try to, um, you know, really try to help them resolve their cases in the best way possible. And I believe I'm compassionate. You know, I'm a mother. I have three daughters. Um, I see a lot of people come before me and usually when I'm helping them, they're not in the best time of their life. I mean, usually when somebody's in the criminal justice system or in the legal system in general, it's usually not because things are going well in their life. So I really do try to be compassionate to people and uh, treat them with respect and how I would want to be treated if I was in that situation, because it's intimidating. And it, anything I can do to help them get through it with, you know, less stress and less angst, I, I try to do it. Hmm. And when you started down this path, uh, about 20 years ago, 20 years or so ago, when you started down this path, did you see yourself running for judge? What made you want to run for judge? I did not. <laughs> um, and actually, if you would have said three years ago I was doing this, I would have said you're crazy. Um, it was something that I actually ran in 2020 for a district court spot and I was unsuccessful. I had put in for an appointment and I didn't get it. And I always said, oh, I would put in for an appointment, but I would never run famous last words. So I wasn't successful that time around. And I'm a true believer that things happen for a reason that I just don't believe that position was meant to be. So when, um, you know, it came to be, we knew Judge Beagle was going to be retiring. I said to myself, maybe this is my calling. So I thought about it and I consulted with family and friend and colleagues. And that's when I decided to do, uh, to run for Judge Beagle's spot. I uh, it will most likely start out a family spot. We have a little, uh, some appointments going on probably in our circuit court, but as of right now, it looks like this will be a family position. Um, I, again, I, I have children. I care about people. Um, I care about families. Um, I myself personally have been through a divorce, so I've helped people through them as an attorney. And I've also been through one myself. So I just, I do believe, I believe, I believe I could do some good in our community and I've served our community for over 20 years as a lawyer, and I would love to continue that as a judge. Now, this next question, Don, is a very, very important question. You running for judge means that you have to have good judgment. And you've, you've lived quite a few places in Genesee County. You've had some experience with life in Detroit. Yeah. Of all the places you've been, who has the best counties? Who has the best conies? Yes. Flint. <laughs> Flint. There we go. I think she's I don't get a Detroit Detroit style. I think she's ready. I never get a Detroit style coney. It's <laughs> always Flint. I'm, I was I was crying when they closed Angelos. <laughs> well, that, that's that's a, a great answer. That's a good answer. Something else I have to ask, because obviously the way we're doing this now, we're using technology. You and I are not face to face like a traditional or typical interview. And um with COVID, we've had to move, you know, to different means to get our daily lives done. So how do you feel about court proceedings happening via Zoom? 
Okay. Today probably is not the good day to ask, but I will say this. Um, I was in court earlier uh, doing my court appointed stuff down at McCree um, in downtown Flint. That's the central district court here in Genesee County. So I was down there handling pretrials and uh, the internet went down. So I had clients that were in jail that I wanted to speak to over video. And then of course I, we had, um, where the judge was trying to do some zooms on some other matters not related to me. And anyway, the jail was down, the internet was down. So today it was terribly inconvenient. But with that being said, when it's working, it can be very convenient. Um, and I would do it for certain matters, but there are certain matters that I would not. And this mm -hmm. is why. Um, anything that involved sworn testimony, so an evidentiary hearing or a trial, I would want to do in person. And here's the issue. Um, right now, you don't know who else is in my house with me. I got a whole, I, it's really quiet. They're being really good. Everybody's here. But um, what we don't want is a witness sitting there and somebody's next to them sliding notes, mm -hmm. uh, you know, tampering or, you know, interfering with the testimony. We want to protect the integrity of the hearing or the trial and make sure that whatever testimony we're getting out of somebody is truthful and not interfered with. So that can be a problem when you're doing those types of proceedings by Zoom. So, uh, but now for a status conference or a quick settlement conference or a pretrial, a lot of the judges are doing um, the probable cause conferences for felonies by Zoom. That's what Judge Manley was doing today when her system went down for a little bit. Um, so for stuff like that, I think it can be really efficient and great. But like I said, when it comes to something that involves testimony, I'm a true believer that we should have them there because there was actually an instance, it was a uh, court down south of here. And the, the prosecutor was very observant and they were doing a probable uh, preliminary examination on an assault case where a lady was allegedly assaulted by her boyfriend. The prosecutor noticed on Zoom that the victim was acting very weird. Mm -hmm. um, and had the phone very close to her face, like wasn't letting it pan out really at all. Well, she texted the officer in charge and basically said, I think, I think the defendant's there with her. And, you know, there's a no contact order. He's not even supposed to be around her. Sure enough, um, she must have heard back from the officer in charge. And then she says to the judge, she says, judge, I, I think the defendant might be in the same house with this woman. Um, and so the judge told the defendant, you need to, which I thought was really smart on the judge's part. He's like, I want you to go outside right now. He's like, what house are you at? And he said, like, whatever his address is. And he said, I want you to go out right now with your phone. And I want you to show me the address number on the house and the street name. And he's like, oh, my battery is getting ready to die. Well, by then the cop showed up and arrested him right in the house. Mm -hmm. So th th those are some problems with it. But for the most part, like I said, for just kind of basic things like settlement conferences, a pretrial status conference, I, I think it can be helpful. And um, what we've seen lately, we've seen a rise in uh, just some mental health issues, concerns. We're seeing more and more substance abuse. Uh, I'm just wondering, what is your position on specialty courts uh, that deal with substance abuse issues and mental health issues? I think the specialty courts are a great idea. We have some, like I said, we have all of them in our county. Uh, we have the mental health court and the veterans court, which is handled by Judge Barkey in the probate court. And then we have sobriety court and also we have drug court. I think they're great because I, as I said earlier, um, not all people are inherently bad. Um, some people have, uh, they just fall into a substance abuse issue. Um, when I was on the felony list, I had a few um, uh, clients that were heroin addicts. And the reason that they became heroin addicts is every single one of them was in a car accident and they were prescribed opioids. And then when the prescriptions ran out, they were addicted and they turn to the streets. So we don't, we're not dealing with inherently bad people. We're dealing with people who unfortunately became addicted to painkillers and then had to turn to the streets when the physicians cut off their prescriptions. So drug court is a great way, or if they have an alcohol problems, sobriety court. And then I've had clients that clearly have mental health issues. And so when I said earlier, I really try to listen to my clients and I really try to assess the situation to see, you know, not everybody deserves to go to jail. You know, some people just make a bad decision or they fall into some sort of addiction issue. So I think that our specialty courts are great. One that I might, you know, that I think might even be a good thing to add would be some sort of like anger management or 
because we've seen a rise of, it seems like a lot of domestic violence cases and other assaultive cases. And especially during COVID, uh, because I think folks were just kind of, you know, crowded in with each other and, you know, just, you know, right. people need to work better on how they handle, you know, their anger management and not lashing out at people. And in addition to when we, when we talk about like mental health issues and substance abuse issues, one of the things we're seeing is a rise in uh, juvenile court cases as a result of both of those things and maybe even just some at home family problems. So what is your position on juvenile crime and how those cases should be handled? Well, and it's, it's interesting you asked me that because I was actually a victim of juvenile crime when I lived in the city of Flint. Mm -hmm. uh, a 15 year old uh, boy uh, threw a Molotov cocktail on my vehicle in my driveway and caught my car and my garage on fire. Mm -hmm. And I was an attorney at the time. I had finished law school. I was already practicing law. And at first I was very angry and upset. But as I settled down a little bit, um, the dad had come to court and the stepmom and they brought me his report card and showed me that, you know, this kid was actually, you know, a good student. He went to Southwestern Academy. Um, he had like all A's and B's. What I think happened with this young man is that I think he got into uh, the wrong crowd. And I think he was influenced by some older people in the neighborhood. And so anyway, um, one of the things in juvenile court we have is called consent calendar, uh, which allows them to go through like a probationary period um, if they, you know, su successfully complete that and do everything that they're supposed to do, it won't be a permanent mark on their record. Um, I am for that. And I can even say that as a victim of juvenile crime, um, because when I was consulted by the prosecutor and the defense attorney in my case, I agreed to it. Um, like I said, I was I was hurt and angry at first, and um, I did give a victim impact statement and his sentencing and everything. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I I realized again, you know, you, you got to kind of look at the totality of the circumstances. This was not somebody who had become, you know, was starting to become a career criminal. And I've had, I, I, it's funny, I check the computer every now and then. I know it probably sounds silly, but I look his name up and I haven't seen it. So I'm hoping that that experience taught him a lesson. And so when you're looking at, you know, to, to kind of transition over to um, me handling cases as a lawyer now, instead of being the victim, I think, again, you just have to be objective. You have to look at these kids, you know, they might've had a horrible upbringing, um, no support, no, you know, anybody there to help them guide them and be role models for them. And so I wouldn't be all for just, okay, we're going to throw kids in jail or we're going to throw kids in prison. I mean, I, I just, the whole idea is to, uh, catch them at the beginning, rehabilitate them, get them whatever they need, whether it be counseling, whether it be, um, substance abuse treatment, whatever, to try to rehabilitate them and keep them from going down this path. And that should definitely be the goal with juveniles because they are her future. And again, not all people are inherently bad. They, for whatever reason, just might make a bad decision. Absolutely. Absolutely. And before we get out of here, I just want to play a quick round of this or that. Um, it's <laughs> nonsensical. There's no rhyme or reason to it. Just whatever one you choose, just blurt out really quickly. Alligators <laughs> or elephants? Alligators or elephants? Yes. Elephants. <laughs> okay. Summer or winter? Summer. <laughs> okay. Uh, maize and blue or green and white? Maize and blue. <laughs> <laughs> I won't hold that against you since you got the voting dog answer right. Um, but in November, the voters are going to have to play their own game of this or that. And I want to make sure that um, when it comes to Attorney Don Weir and them trying to figure out if they should vote for her for cir circuit court a judge, that they understand why this is their decision. So please, I'll leave the floor to you as we get out of here. Why should they vote for you? Well, you know, and we've covered a lot of ground and Candace, your questions have been great. Um, you know, first and foremost, I, I am a compassionate person. I care about people. Um, I think through my answers, I've demonstrated that I'm not like, let's just lock people up and throw away the key. I understand there are a lot of dynamics to every person's situation. And as a lawyer for over 20 years, I have been able to evaluate cases, evaluate people and try to get a resolution that's truly in my client's best interest. Um, you know, I have three children. 
I, I, and I realize the value of children and they're our future. Um, I just believe with my knowledge and my compassion and my experience, I truly believe that I can do good in our community. And, you know, I just hope that if I'm elected that I can fill Judge Beagle's shoes. All right. Well, Thank you again for just giving us an opportunity to get to know a little bit more about you today. Uh, once again, uh, with us uh, this for this segment of uh, Meet the Candidates, Attorney Don Weir, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for joining us on Meet the Candidates. If you haven't seen your candidate, make sure you have them join us. Tell them to give us a call at the number below. You're really not that talented. You're not attractive. Too fat. You're too short. Too old. Why don't you just give up? Give up. Give up. Just give up. for your future at Mott Community College. Oh, hey, look, that's my sister. Hey, Nicole, isn't your dad supposed to be here? He's coming, he promised. <laughs> I trust him. Showtime, guys, one minute. 